Hey, remind me how to pronounce your last name again? Well, in Italy, they would say like D'Alessandro, but my family, we just say D'Alessandro. Oh, D'Alessandro. D'Alessandro, yeah. Oh, that's easy. D'Alessandro, I got it. D'Alessandro. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for your next comedian, Eric Dissel, Dissandro, what is it? D'Alessandro. Eric D, what? D'Alessandro. D'Alessandro. Eric D, I'll, uh, one more time. Eric D'Alessandro. Yeah, L ladies and gentlemen, Derek Alejandro. D, D'Alessandro, D'Alessandro. Eric Dolly Parton. Solly Dendro. Rhoda Dendron. Dolly Martin. Deli Sandals. Dollar Sandwich. D.L. Hughley. Tony Danza. Val Venus. Dude, Eric D'Alessandro. Got, got it. Ladies and gentlemen, Ellen DeGeneres. Hi friends, welcome to Really Famous. Today I'm bringing you comedian Eric D'Alessandro, whose comic videos are positively hilarious and not surprisingly often go viral. Eric is super creative and entertaining. He does a very funny Staten Island guy, I guess you could call it, and many people know him specifically from Instagram or YouTube, but he's also a full-on stand-up comedian who's been selling out big theaters with over a thousand seats. I discovered him a couple of years ago when my former intern, Kyle, suggested I check him out on Instagram where he is huge and does tons of short comedy bits that have me rolling on the floor. So yes, I started laughing right away and I was hooked. So I reached out to Eric and I asked if he'd like to do the show. He said yes and he has been appreciative and responsive and open and I just love that. We taped our talk in person in New York City at the iconic comedy club, Caroline's on Broadway, where basically every major comedian ever has performed. In fact, after we taped this conversation, I was talking to my contact there and he told me they have a special chair there just for my friend, Louis Anderson. So of course I had to ask him to bring the chair out so I could sit on it and take a picture of myself sitting on it and send it to Louie, which I did. So big thanks to Caroline's for hosting us. If you are in New York or will be at some point, definitely check it out. It's on Broadway and 50th, right around Times Square. And when you walk in, you can really feel the gravitas of all the performers who've made their mark there. So if you go to my Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter feed, you'll see behind the scenes photos of Eric and me at Caroline's. My team has also been playing around with some new videos, montages, and behind the scenes photos. So I definitely encourage you to check those out. Also, you can watch this entire interview on my YouTube channel. So check that out if you haven't already. Check out Eric's website to see an assortment of videos and get tickets to his shows. Oh, and by the way, have you joined my new Facebook friends and fans group yet? It is fun. I post behind the scenes extras, I ask questions, and I request input from group members. And it is a great place to talk about new episodes or old ones too. I put a link to all of those things in today's show notes. And that's that. Here we are sitting on stage at Caroline's with just a teeny tiny audience, his girlfriend, Leanna, watching from the seats, and my two new team members, Candice and Kyle. Here we go. Okay, so you're back in Staten Island. Yes. Your birthplace. Yes. Have we started? Yeah, we're starting. This is how, how did we start? It, from what point did we go Do you never from? listen to podcasts? Are you new to this world? I mean, usually they say, hey guys, welcome to the podcast. No, 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 no. I will do an going. intro later. Okay. So we just start, I pick up the conversation where I feel like it's a perfect time because people are just okay. eavesdropping on us. This is mm. not a performance. Yeah, we're not under lights with a microphone on our hand at, at all. This is, this. I, I always hang out at Caroline's with the air conditioner off. I always do. Who doesn't do this? Now I feel like we need a formal intro. Aww. Here we are at Caroline's <laughs> with Eric D'Alessandro. Nice. Points? It was good. I don't say it that way, but sure. I know. You say it, D'Alessandro. Yeah. So did destroy, you ever? We destroy the Italian, the beautiful Italian language. What D'Alessandro, make it all nasally and burrowy. What part of Italy is your family from? Sicily. Marineo, Sicily. I Where? Think that's in Sicily. Who? I mean, no idea. Uh, my my grandparents were born in America, so I'm really I'm really American. 
the uh, Italian thing is just a front. I'm actually, uh, I can't even think of something I was going to say. I, I was thinking, who am I going to offend by saying something else? Do I'm Italian. It's a joke, but I'm not that, like, I, I don't have, like, off the boat uh, Italian immigrant parents, and I don't have Tony Soprano as a father. They're just very normal uh, American people. But you do it very well. I mean, it is, it is, it's, like, not, not part of my life, but it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I can turn it on when I want to and, and expose the hilarity of it, but I'm not that kind of person like I don't people ask me what, what part of Italy is or your grandparents I have no idea I've never been to Italy I don't know you've never been to Italy no yeah you should need to go it's so good there yeah I would like to people are, oh you gotta go you, you if you have five thousand dollars you should right. just do it <laughs> that's a fact um, certain places it. more than others but if you want to go to Italy on a budget I know how to do it I'm telling no, you I'm not, I, I'm not even if I'll, I'll do it um thank god I can afford it but I just I'm not a fan of uh, I, I get nervous that I'm gonna go to another country and I'm going to like cross the street wrong and I'm going to be getting screamed at in another language and just be like, I don't know what I did. And then yeah. I'm just stuck in Germany for three years, sentenced to hard labor or something like this. Do you do that in Germany? Probably not. I don't know. I, that never happened to me there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say it happened. But I did drive on the Autobahn. <laughs> oh, really? That was fun. So I haven't been in Germany much, but I think I did it on like the, the, the beginning at the end of another trip. So and you travel a lot. I do like to travel, and mm. Italy is my favorite place, not going to lie. I love okay. it, but I did take one big trip, and we went to, we flew into Germany, into Dusseldorf, because it was cheaper. Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf. I loved his work in Harry Potter. Yeah, that was the guy in Harry Potter, right? He's laughing. I don't know if that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, Dusseldorf, Dumbledore, whatever you want to oh, call hey, it. Dumbledore. Whatever you want to call it. it was close. There, and then drove all through into... France and Italy. Actually, mm. no, we didn't make it to Italy that trip, but it was all good. Anyway, I did drive on the Autobahn, and that was very cool. I was probably driving 80-something, but in the right lane, everybody was going faster in the left lane. It was very cool. Oh, wow, Yeah, really? like a little scary. You can't be a slow driver at all if you're going to be on the you Autobahn. you just go as fast as you want. Yeah, there's no limit, but cool. it's the same in Italy, too. You drive as fast as you want, pretty much. I wouldn't People know. People know the rules there, too. You mm -hmm. stay in the right lane. Even if you're driving fast, you stay in the right lane. And then anybody who's driving faster can go past you in the left lane. It's a good system. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. All right, so you're sticking to home. You like it better in the U.S. I gotcha. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just kidding. I, I, know, I know, Whatever. So, sure. All right, so I feel like you're, people are always expecting you to be funny. Is that a big pressure? <sighs> Mm, not really. I'm not really that. I, I, I'm. Ex I'm extremely silly, but I'm not always silly. Uh -huh. So like, it's a, when she, my. I would keep looking over here to my girlfriend, but like she, she'll see. Um, this morning when we got sandwiches at a deli, people. I don't know if they they expect me to like fill in the holes of a conversation. They'll just be like, hey, are you Eric? Are you Eric? And I'll be like, yeah, and they'll just stare at me. Waiting for me to say something. I'm uh, like, I'm not really on right now, man. I'm just waiting for my sandwich. I don't know what. I get it. I so you're not. Uh, by the way, you're not on here. I know we're joking that you're on a stage with lights at Caroline's, and it's a fact that you are. Yeah. But you're not. You're not here to perform. I'm just to be clear. Yeah, that's fine. I'm the one to tell you or to kind of open you up. Okay. And let oh, you. Oh, should I cry? Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. Crying <laughs> does happen on the show. You are really? welcome to cry, but okay. it has to be real. Okay, I gotta hear so my, I I gotta to hear my to own your, jokes to cry. I have to get to your therapy, the root of what you need therapy for. I've been to therapy, so I could, I could, we, I got some shortcuts ready to go if you want. What are your therapy? Um, I have generalized anxiety disorder, so that's fun. Um, Is that a fact you've been diagnosed with it? Oh, yeah. By the way, Big time. I'm an ex therapist, just so you know. I'm a licensed Re therapist. Really? So for real, I'm not just joking around. Okay. Like I have that background. What's an ex therapist? Well, just, I don't practice now. Are you allowed to? Sure. If you tell me things to do, is it is it like illegal now? If you like, you know, exposure therapy and all this stuff. Well, let me put it cognitive, this way. huh? Okay. Cognitive exposure. CBT. Uh, CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Or another thing that I'm not going to say. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. you have anxiety regularly, or like a kind of like a low level but constant. Um, pretty much. It it manifested when I was younger. And it comes in like waves. I would like call them like episodes. Yeah. So it would be like um, something really stressful. I would get stuck in like a place for, it could be months of just horrific 
uh, it's what feels like, I always try to tell people like, imagine if you took your parents' car out and you crashed it and then you just snuck it back in the garage and every time the phone rang, you thought it was gonna be like the police that they caught you with it or like you're waiting for someone to find out. Just this incredible sense of panic all the time for no reason. It could be the silliest thing. Your brain could just be like, now you're just gonna be nervous and then you're just nervous for God knows how long. Um, but I've been doing well with it. I, honestly, since we changed up our, our uh, diet and we're working out and stuff, I feel like it's a lot more manageable. Really? Yeah. I hate so to sound like a California hippie, but I, I, I really believe yeah. in it. But so like what diet changes did you do that you noticed it was actually impacting your anxiety level? So basically anything with chemicals, my friend Matt has been telling me for years. So I, I mean, I was, I would, my diet was horrific. I have a re I'm very lucky with a very fast metabolism, so I could eat 600 donuts and you would not know. Maybe not 600, but uh, I, I could eat anything and like I, I would really not gain weight. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not unhealthy, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then um, I forget what happened, but like we stopped getting fast food. We switched to like organic chicken and then uh, we started working out. I switched over to Ezekiel bread because I couldn't get through a workout. And then I read like white, white bread's bad. And then I started to feel better. And I literally, we were on the road one time and we were just eating fast food all the time. And we just both felt like crap. Sure. And I didn't believe any of that because it would always be from some, someone with an agenda I felt like, which is like, I can't believe you eat that garbage. And it was always somebody who like didn't really it didn't like see they were trying to connect on a human level. It was always like a judgmental way. And I think if you tell people, um, hey, listen, I loved McDonald's, but I had a negative effect with it. No one ever says that. They just go immediately to judging your diet. How could you have that? Oh my God, I would never. So then you, you get defensive automatically yeah, because that's sure. just what you would do. Yeah. So when I found out on my own that this stuff was affecting me, we were getting, we were on the way to get like Taco Bell one night. I'm like, I actually don't, like I, we had it once during the, the, the pandemic because we were cooking a lot at home and then we got fast food. I was like, I actually don't feel that good. And I, for the first time, I was like, I think this is true. I hadn't had soda, I hadn't had uh, anything processed. Everything we got was from like Whole Foods. It was uh, anything that had canola oil we didn't have, anything that had like bio zixapine seven or all these weird things you didn't know. Yeah. We try to stick to like things that were very, very limited ingredients. And I swear it made a difference. That's big. Okay, so the diet made a big difference. Yeah. What, so did you see a therapist at all? I saw a therapist years ago when I was, uh, so I had a bad, my first, I, I, I got introduced, my family has, my mom's side has mental illness, so thanks mom. Um, and so it was, my. I would speak to some of my uncles about it. They all went through it. And then when I was 17, it sort of manifested with just, I, I don't know, I, I would put, um, I would put too much, um, I would put too much pressure on myself to like enjoy moments too much, which sounds strange, but like I would force myself to like feel this perfect feeling of like, wow, isn't this great? We're at Caroline's or something. And like when you weren't, when you wouldn't feel this feeling of euphoria, I, my, my brain would be like, it would just give me, whenever I would acknowledge that I was happy, my brain would give me something to negate that and think, well, no, you're not happy. Like I saw this meme on Twitter one time that was like, uh, I'm having a good day. And then it said, my anxiety. Well, aren't you worried? And then me, about what? And then my anxiety, I don't know. And then me, oh my God, you're right. So it's just like giving you something to worry about for no reason. Um, so I didn't go to therapy till I was, I think 20. It happened when I was 17 just went away. I didn't even know what to call it. It was like that thing that happened to me. Uh -huh. It lasted like two weeks. And then when I was 20, it got really bad. And then I was 24, I started a job. And that's when like after I gave up on like acting and comedy. And I was like, I guess I'm just gonna get a job for a little while and see like what happens and get a real job. And that was not the right decision for me. Thank God though, because if I didn't have anxiety, I wouldn't be doing something that I love. I'd be stuck at God knows where, doing some job that I probably wouldn't be happy doing. So it was kind of like good to kick me out of there. But I went to therapy then too, and it, we, that's when I learned about exposure therapy, about like getting the problem and living in the anxiety and not running from it, that's the worst thing in the world to do. 
is to run from it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's mm-hmm. the loop that people get caught in, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. oh, and yep. then the rumination starts, which is totally normal. So you learn that yeah. early on. That's good. Yeah. Kind of early on. The f- yeah. I, not early enough. Not early enough. No, not early enough. But it's fine. You know, I hope this is interesting to people. I feel this like. is because we always I'm telling you because I have the therapy background. OK, cool. This is the kind of stuff I do get into with people. I because, hope I'm explaining it well. I feel like I'm rambling. No, but. I think you are. I think that that uh, analogy that you used before will it, it really illustrates it perfectly about that feeling about you wrecking the car. Yep. That's like a perfect illustration of because everybody oh, can relate you. to what that would feel like. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I, that actually happened to me once, which is funny. Like, I hit some guy with my dad's car. I, I, I would, because also, like, my mind is just like numb when I when I'm going through these things, to where I like would just be out of it. And um, one day, it was just an accident. I hit, I hit into, I hit the back of his car, and he it was kind of this jerk guy. And he took my information down, and I went home. And my dad is um, not the smartest man. So he doesn't realize that, you know, accidents happen. He screams as if I did it on purpose. You know, like I hit his, like I hit somebody on purpose. He'll be like, why did you do that? And I'm like, well, I didn't plan to, Dad. So I wouldn't, I can't just tell him, hey, Dad, that was an accident because he would flip out. So I was just waiting for this guy to call me. And I remember thinking, like, this is the exact feeling that I have when I'm, like, it just, you're always... Everything makes you nervous. Right. And, and it's you can't not explain for any it to reason. People. Not for any reason. And you can't explain it to people because like, oh, just don't worry about it, which right. is the best advice right. you could give someone. I think that is a popular piece of advice, right? <laughs> a lot of yeah. people say My that. My dad literally said, just don't worry about it. I'm, right. like, I'm cured. All right. It's not that important. Yeah. Don't worry about well, it. Well, he said, so worry about it. What's, what's going to happen? So worry about it. Like the worst things you could possibly tell someone. But you know what's back? <laughs> and also another thing is when you worry that you're worrying too much. Have you ever done that? Were you worried um, about worrying? Mm, not not so much. Okay, because that's common too. Yeah, I could. Oh, listen, I've learned a lot with my therapist, and you know, I've learned that everybody's ten is a ten. So, like, when you're, well, how's your anxiety level today? Is it a one five? What what is it from one to ten? No matter what yours is, it's the same thing. Yeah, if yours yeah. is a ten, mine's we're, we're feeling the same thing. Yours can be obsessively washing your hands. It could be worrying about death. It could be anything. I've learned about it all and just being able to identify it and, and say what it is. Oh, I'm doing this thing now really helps you totally because you identify what's going on. It's not like this scary thing, which it was to me to be like, what is this thing? And when I told somebody, they would just like, they'd finish my sentences. I'm like, Oh my God. Yes. Uh-huh. So that was really helpful. That's why I really want people, especially in Staten Island where maybe, uh, therapy is not as encouraged or mental health is not as important to people uh, making a blanket statement but um, there are places for sure like that so I want to tell everybody to tell someone talk to someone because it's extremely common and just being able to talk about it and know what you're talking about really helps for sure it helps a lot yeah get help so does the comedy help you deal or does yeah. that cause more Honestly, it anxiety? does. I'm, I'm somebody who, most of my, my material is like, yes, obviously there's a lot of jokes involved, but everything comes from a real place. And uh, my main goal in life was always to be happy. I just wanted to, be, I just wanted to love what I was doing. Like I, there was this teacher in the third grade, I think third or fourth grade, who told us one day, you spend more time here than you do with your parents or, or you do with your family at home. I remember thinking that was the most messed up thing. I, was like, I'm, I spend time doing something I don't want to do more than doing something I do want to do. That stuck with me forever. And I couldn't think of like how many times in my life I've been working with like my father or with friends and thinking like, oh, we have three more hours. How do we kill three hours? And like on your deathbed, the last thing you, the only thing you want is more time. And we're wasting yeah. time. Yeah. Let me let me think of how to waste five hours of my life. That thought, I, it just scares the crap out of me. So I could not go somewhere that I hated day in and day out. My father hated his job. He did it because he had kids and, and I thank him for that. But he didn't love his job. He just did it because he had to put food on the table. And comedy helps me because I play around. That's my job is to play around and like make videos in my apartment and 
have fun. It's literally what I what I would do when I was eleven when I first got a video camera. It's the exact same thing. Yeah, that is. So that's cool. pretty cool. It is. It's really really cool. When I started making money with it, it was like this is the coolest thing. So when did you start ever. making money exactly? Um, when I really started doing stand up, I would say like three years ago. Three years ago, just about. So you've been making uh, maybe like two, full time two years ago. <laughs> yeah, two years ago. So how many years before that then was it of you doing this stuff? So I have like a weird path. Um, when I I was on YouTube early back in the day with like uh, kind of around the same. You know Bo Burnham. Yeah. He's like a hero of mine. He's we've been into his new special. He's just a yeah. I haven't st- seen his. He's special. a stone cold genius. He's in eighth grade, right? He did eighth grade. Yeah. Loved Great eighth movie. grade. Oh my god. Amazing. He's beyond brilliant i used to like to think oh i'm like him and then he skyrocketed i'm like i'm not like him at all he's a lot better than me so um but like we were on youtube at the same time just putting up putting out uh videos and stuff and then i made one on staten island that kind of like went viral back in the day didn't it didn't even have like i think at the peak it had like fifty thousand views but forty nine thousand of them came from staten island so like Everywhere I went, I was known as like the Maria Marie kid, the kid who made like the Sweet 16 video. So I had a lot of momentum and I had like a little bit of a fan base. I started, when I put out more videos, uh, that would spread and then I got a manager, I got on so World So wait, wait, back up a second. So that was local, did you have a local fan base then? Big local fan base. Okay, so Brooklyn, was... Queens, Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Like and I. then you got the manager. Because they could all relate to what who you were being to like the character you were being. Yeah, sorry. So I'm skipping over. So yeah, there okay. was this, I did like, the, it was this Sweet 16. I, I, I would, sweet, sweet 16s are something that I don't understand. There's, they're not, they're not significant. The girl doesn't, you can't drive, you can't mm-hmm. vote. It's the identical to when you're 15, but it's a play, it's a thing to showcase how much money you're, we have on Staten Island, which is what people do. And um, even if they don't have it. So I would, always, I would go to a lot of these when I was 16 and it would just be this rotating thing of like a pink dress, same DJ, same candle speeches. Then the next week, a purple dress, the same DJ, the same song. This, and I was thinking like, how is this special if they're having the same exact party every single week? How special could this be? So I just would, I would just tease people and I would at parties I would just be like oh my first candle goes to my mother mom you always there for me and I would just do these like stupid candle ceremony things so I made this like a theatrical thing I put on a wig and a dress and it was just very it was just very silly making fun of like the girls that I hung out with or whatever and that just blew up it just it it, in the tri-state area it just got a lot of just got a lot of uh, views and stuff. Like I said, it was early days of YouTube. Yeah. So it was so like what, special. Like, this was like what kind of, you were 16 at the time? This was, I was 19. This oh, was years okay. after I was 16. But oh, like, because right. YouTube wasn't really a thing then. And yeah. then I remember I just like was getting into doing skits and stuff. And then I did when I was 19. I was just 2009. Um, and then 9, 10, 11, I was just like the kid who made Marie and Marie Sweet 16. And mm-hmm. then I did like raps. I did like impression videos and just like random videos. Um, and that got me a decent following. And then, I don't know if you know if World Star Hip Hop is, it was this giant blog website back in, it's still around, but it was huge like in 2011 to 2014. I got featured on their front page a couple of times and those, they get millions of views. So I got a manager from that and we started doing this path, which just wasn't for me. Um, I respect improv comedy, I respect any type of art, but it just wasn't for me. It wasn't like I thought this was bad it was just like this isn't for me I'd go to these improv classes and it was just real kind of theater geeks is the most respectful way I can say like the people who you expect to be doing a scene with like Will Ferrell or like you know uh, Tim Meadows and instead you get some kid making a Star Wars reference and I'm just like I don't really find this funny so is this like a groundlings kind of thing kind of UCB which is oh yeah yeah I I was at UCB for a little while I hated every minute of it okay and it's hard for me to excel in an environment where I don't feel comfortable Mm -hmm. where you know it when when with stand-up I started getting comfortable and I was like oh I can thrive here but UCB and, and improv I don't want to judge or say anything bad because I don't think I'm better than anyone but it just was like not for me I was just like I don't I'm, I'm not finding a, a niche here I don't know how to play against what they're saying it was very dorky very like just theater kids and I wasn't a theater kid really I was just I was playing sports and I remember one kid was like I just don't understand basketball in my group and I was like how can I talk to this person <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was so weird and um, 
So I did that for a little while and we sort of just grew apart because she had this path for me. Her other clients were, they're huge stars now. She 100% had the right path for me. If I would have listened to her, I 1,000%. Uh, Thomas Middleditch. Oh, okay. Um, Silicon he's, Valley. He's the improv guy. He's brilliant. I'm ups- I, I loved his... So I didn't realize he was an improv guy. I think of him as Silicon oh. Valley guy. Well, that was his big break, but he's a brilliant, okay. brilliant improv uh, artist. He's hilarious. And um, she worked with um, uh, uh, Dion Cole, who is a great... Oh, he's so... He's love incredible. Him. Yeah, I mean, well, but he I was. I think of him in he shows was a, too. He was a stand-up, but okay. uh, just like people that I would meet and I was respected so much, and if I would have listened to her, I would have been like, "Yeah, but it wasn't." She knows for what you, she's talking about, but it wasn't for you. But yeah, she wanted me to go to like diction classes, and I feel like my New York attitude is kind of who I am. Whereas if I would have lost that, yeah. I don't know who I don't know what I would have sounded like if it wasn't this New York kid. That's kind of what I have. Because you're also so familiar that New York thing. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just the people who are in our area, but I don't know. But it just feels like like you know this guy. You know, when yeah. you first see him, you feel like, oh, I know this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like he's from the neighborhood or something. Yeah, yeah. I have a huge following in Detroit with uh, uh, the Chaldean community, which are Christian Iraqi. They're, they're from Iraq and they're Christians. So they have a lot of the same Italian like uh, pressures from their family and religion mm. and food and, and stuff like this. Yeah. So um, uh, a lot of um, Spanish people, Asian people. So it's very much the same. Diverse. Yeah, it's the same kind of like a lot of people tell me that's my dad too. And I think that's what makes me relatable. And that's also what, got, what gave me my start. So I think running from that would have been the not say. the best thing. Um, again, if I would have listened to her, I would have been probably on SNL by now. But that was ever my dream. I, I love it. Of course. Would yeah. you go on SNL? Of course. But I wasn't like, please, God, let me get on SNL. It was never really my dream. Um, All right. So you got your manager. She wanted you to do this. You just, it we worked together for about a year. It, she had some good opportunities with her, but like it just didn't work out. We just b- bumped heads and she was just like over it. It was like a breakup. She was like, I can't do this anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we stopped working together and I kind of just gave up because another big thing, like I said, I just, I just wanted to be happy. So I was in a really long relationship with this girl. And then when we finally broke up and I was finally like single, I was 21, 22 going out with my friends, meeting girls, dating. I was distracted by my own life. Sure. And that's more important to me than anything was my actual life, like just being a normal person. So when she would say like, did you do this? And I'm like, oh no, I went down to the Jersey Shore and got drunk and made out with some random girl. Like that, that's what I wanted to do then. I didn't want to be going to some weird comedy jam in the village where they're snapping their fingers and talking about Lord of the Rings stuff. Like I didn't get it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for, I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to, maybe that's not, maybe it's not destined for me. Like, cause it didn't happen naturally. I think maybe that's just not for me. I hated it. So maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. Um, met her. Leanna. And my girlfriend, Leanna, the love of my life. Uh, I make a lot of jokes, but it, but it's true. You know, she was so driven and I just knew that I was going to be with her forever. And I was just like, what do I do now? I have, I, I got the girl that I was searching for, so now what? What do you do now? And I've just tried other jobs and uh, it was it was just uh, not good. Um, didn't love it. Did, okay, so what it. are these other jobs? So I, work, I worked at an airport, at Newark Airport. Shut up, as yeah. what? Uh, so I worked for the Port Authority. I was basically, so my friend had a job there and with the Port Authority is interesting because you can, it's a, it's a really great, uh, organization or company. I'm not sure what they are. They just own all the bridges. And yeah, the yeah. But if, if you start there as like a janitor, literally a janitor, you could work your way up to, to one of the supervisors of like one of the bridges. Like internally moving up is really, really, huh. it's really okay. encouraged there, which is great. So I was thinking, okay, in the meantime, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do this forever. My dad was really adamant about me finishing college. So was my mom. Um, so I was doing that and I was going to night classes and I remember I was with this guy all day. He was like 60 years old and he was in a bad financial situation. So I was hanging out with him all day and he just like made me feel, it was like the ghost of Christmas future. Like I was hanging out with me in the future and I was like, oh, and Jim Carrey has this great saying of like his dad took a safe job. His dad was an accountant, I think, and he got let go. So I was like, if you could fail at something you hate, you might as well do what you love. So I was with this guy and he just like showed me like what my future could be like. And I just, it scared the crap out of me. And I just went down a spiral. Uh, 
of just like, I couldn't get out of it. I was just stuck. And I was thinking like, well, the acting path didn't work out. Now the, now this isn't working out. What do I do now? Uh, is, is, do I just kill myself? Is that what you're supposed to do? Is that, that I thought about, like, I didn't think to kill myself. I thought, is that what I'm supposed to do? Like I have no other options right now. And, um, I just, I hadn't been doing comedy. I hadn't been doing anything. Um, so I quit immediately. And then I just did like soul searching for a while. I've always wanted to write music that never connected with people. I don't think people like me as like an artist. I think cause I'm just destined to be a clown. Uh, so that people wouldn't really respond to that. I tried for a long time. And then one day I dropped her off. Uh, she was going, she went to FIT here in, here in the city. And I dropped her off at the bus stop and I, I went home and I was like, I've never just emailed a thousand people. I've never just tried to email someone, uh, like an agent or a manager. Oh, so I okay. literally just, I got an IMDB free trial for two weeks. Pro. IMDB pro. And I emailed 500 people separately. Cause if you, I don't want it to go in their spam file. So I didn't just put all their things in one. I would w copy and paste oh, sure, right. all day long. Yeah. You don't want to do like a BCC. I don't want them right. to see, I don't want them to go to their spam. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, and out of like 500 emails, I may have gotten 15 responses. So this is maybe. managers, agents? Ma age, I, I, I emailed Taylor Producers. Swift's booking agent. He was like, I don't know how you got my email. You seem talented. Good luck, kid. And it was like, the, I didn't even know where I got these people. Okay. Like I look up Jonah Hill. Who represents Jonah Hill? Send everybody an email. Uh -huh. Who represents Seth Rogen? Send everybody an email. And, uh, and, one, and Melissa McCarthy's manager answered me. And he liked my stuff. So I started So what, did you send video clips or something? I sent YouTube clips. I sent headshots. I lied about my experience. Um, and I just was like, you know, hoping that uh, somebody would give me a chance. I worked with him for a while. Um, I also, that's when I started doing stand up too. I was like, I've never actually just tried to do stand up. I wasn't posting on YouTube, I just like disappeared. Um, and I would just go come to the city and just do open mics. And um, I didn't love it because it, it was just, I, I didn't know what I was, I didn't really feel like a stand-up. And then, um, what happened after that? And I started working with Christian and he started sending me auditions and I'd go to LA for like pilot season. So that felt like something was going on. So that was back to acting again. Back to, I just, I don't even know what, it, I just wanted to be in, uh -huh, in entertainment. The just yeah. doing something that I felt like I could be, like, be a kid, just be yeah. happy making up, make believe or something. So um, that, that, that went on for a couple of years. I made this like hour and a half movie on YouTube about like my life. It was fictional, but some real things. Um, it's called Five Miles from the Spotlight. If anybody wants to watch it on YouTube, it's free. It's an hour and a half. Oh, nice. But, okay. But I, so you wrote it, acted in it, produced it, directed it, edited it, everything? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and I made nice. a soundtrack to it too, which was like rap. It was horrible, but... Uh, yeah, my, my girlfriend is. She's a fantastic uh, videographer. When I was like, just, just film this, make it look like. And everybody that I gave the camera to, I would just be like, "You'll be fine. Don't worry." And it's like a mockumentary style, uh -huh. so the shaky camera works with it. I did that on purpose in All case right. it looked choppy. Um, and it's a fictionalized uh, idea of like what what it'd be like for someone who is known from YouTube, and then then you see him working at the supermarket, and it's like my life is like in shambles. I'm like this alcoholic. Um, and I just, I was always just trying to create something. Um, and this went on for a while and my life didn't really make sense until I moved to LA in 2018. Okay. So you moved in 2018. So you had a manager at this point. I had a manager at this point. Yeah. And okay. an agent at this point. And you were doing pilots and whatnot. I was, the pilot season. Yeah. But not, I mean, uh -huh. hard, I mean, there's a honeymoon phase with all okay. these agents and managers. And if you don't book something in six weeks, they literally forget that you're a person. And yeah. I've heard that about agents, like period, even if you do book things. Oh yeah. They're, I don't need an agent. I'll, I don't think I'll ever have one again. Um, but is your manager helpful? Um, so I don't really work with him much anymore uh -huh. um, since I did my own thing, which is also another tip for people. In 2021, you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. It's you, your camera, and the internet, and you can do anything you want. Just ask anyone who's doing it online. Um, so what did you but say? But you're super successful. So that's not happening to everyone. You're putting up your clips on Instagram, and millions of people are watching them and loving them. I worked, I worked towards that though, you know, um, and that's, that, that was a scary thing. And I moved to LA too, was like, I have to make something happen. I didn't know what it was going to be. 
I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, all right, so if I'm there, I'll be in their face more. Maybe I'll get more auditions. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll just do more stand up. Um, and when we, when we moved there, it was, it was just sink or swim. What are you, now you have to figure it out. So just not being home was really, really helpful. I mean, I always tell people, I don't need to be in Los Angeles, just not living at home. Oh, that makes sense. With your Italian, sure. Italian mother who will cook and clean make for me, you. yeah, feel way too comfortable. Uh -huh. Cook and clean everything. And they, my parents are very supportive, but they're also really realistic. Every once in a while, they'll be like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm just trying to figure it out, all right? But they, they would see me. I wasn't just sitting around, you know, oops, sorry, just That's your phone. broke my phone. I wasn't sitting around all day smoking weed and like not trying. They saw me actively trying mm -hmm. hard, but it was very difficult. You don't, everybody says, what do I do? Well, what do I do? My brother would be like, well, how, why don't you just go out, go, go on auditions? Okay, one audition, please. Like it's, people don't know That's what the like hell. That's like, just stop worrying. Yeah, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they're, they're, people say it to me all the time. How come you don't do movies? Oh, okay. Hey, okay. is this Hollywood? I'll take a movie, please. So people just don't get it. They don't know how difficult it is. So when I moved to LA, I also did this thing where like, um, I, I was almost like afraid of becoming like Jaleel White, who was the actor who played Steve Urkel. Yeah. So, Wait, didn't he just die? No, God, oh, no. Oh, no, it's He's not him. Track. I'm sorry. I'll be depressed um, when Jaleel White um, dies. Um, confusing forbid. him with Screech. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, there's okay. another similar yeah. typecast kid. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I would do this, like, uh, this, this character, this, like, Staten Island girl niche comedy, and I would, I would do this video or something that I worked so hard on, and no one would care about it. But then if I put the wig on and make fun of girls that I grew up with, it would explode. And I was like, it's kind of depressing, because it was like, I feel like an artist, and I feel like I have other things to say, but all they want me to do is do this character again. And I ran from it, I think, too quickly. Mm. So when I got to LA, I was like, if they want Italian-American Staten Island material, that's what they're gonna get. So I just doubled down on what I was like not wanting to do forever. And I just, uh, if it, like, I would just tell by my analytics, like, oh, this video got a thousand likes. Okay. I'm gonna do one just like this. And then that got 2,000 likes, and then 5,000, and then 10,000. So it just kept growing and uh, that's really when I started to realize like there's 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 nothing between myself and the audience anymore. There used to be this story of like the in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s of Hollywood. There's the gatekeepers of like I have to approve if you're in the club or not. And now it's like, hey, guess what? You don't own anything anymore. I could do whatever I want. And I would go to the comedy store. I'd try to do uh, open mics there, and it was just this the personification of Hollywood, of like. 4,000 people putting their name in the hat then picking out seven and being like you could do it one minute and of course half the people are there kissing ass so they get their, they get their name pulled every week mm -hmm. and the other half was like winning the lottery and I've never had good luck I'm a Mets and a Knicks fan so I'm not going to win anything in my life so I did that a couple of times I'm like this is so outdated how come no one has Interesting, and it was it's so deeply rooted, right? It was yeah. so long, it's so long standing. That was the system. And is that the is comedy store? Is that where that I hear the comedians talk about it all the time, like the older comedians, mm -hmm. Mitzi, it, the older, yeah, exactly. Comedians. That's what I'm saying. Yep. Is that the place with Mitzi? Whatever. Yeah, she's dead. Yeah, you wanted someone who's dead. She's dead. <laughs> I did want someone Finally. who's dead. How'd you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that was. But it's that thing where like you have to get the approval from the people. Yep. And they just decide whatever, not based on anything. Yeah, yeah. That you can do anything about. Yep. I guess. But now, you, but then you realize that now and you don't need that anymore. That's old and outdated. So how did you figure that? out just because people were directly interacting with your like videos with yeah. your on social yeah you would see so i would any night you go to the comedy store you'll see five comedians in a row that are ridiculous they will destroy yeah, but that is the funniest guy or girl i've ever seen in my life they have three thousand instagram followers they have this idea of it's they're too good, they're too much of an artist, they're too whatever. I thought the same way. Like, they're social media kids. Like, they think they're gonna be Logan Paul if they go on, on the internet. And I get a lot of shit from comedians. They hate my guts. Like, com comedian comedians. Oh, because you're not in the system? Oh yeah, I'm not in the circle. I did, I did this rogue punk rock thing. They don't like me, I have a man bun. They hate everything about me. Um, and what the hell would I care? I don't care, and I think that 
they th- you watch the Comedy Store documentary, which is fantastic. Obviously, I would love to kill at the Comedy Store, but I'm not going to kiss the feet of someone who has nothing to offer me. Like, I can go around. I'll go this way. Fine. You guys can do all that. I'm going to go headline a show by myself. And I think that many comedians are stuck in like, I want to be Jerry Seinfeld. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. Right, Jerry Seinfeld right. is 70 Done. years old. Yeah. And that there is no such thing there as no friends that sit comedy more. That's not going to happen. They, it's like I, the, the, the metaphor I always use is I'm a big uh, film fa- uh, fanatic. And like when I was in, in college learning about film, every this happens every single generation. The vaudeville actors, yeah. they, they dismissed Done. the movie actors. And then the oh silent, the up and comers you're saying the next generation the silent film actors yeah, were yeah. like the talkies that'll never last, and they, we keep doing it. Oh, social media comedians, this will never last. Now these kids, they're, they're just going to be 55 years old still doing spots, and they can have the respect of their peers. But don't you want more than that? If not, that's fine. So you, you think to- it's totally over? At this point, or will be at some point. The system, the the traditional yeah. system, absolutely. Yeah, because everybody's going is getting older together. Then at that point, do you know how many people I've seen destroy on Kimmel or Letterman or Conan or 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 Fallon, and then you'll never hear of them ever again? That doesn't mean anything. Right. So then, where do they go? So are they still are on social? Like, can you see them do it, or you can you those guys like at the places where you're playing? Because you're selling out where you go on tour now, correct? Yeah. And these are big places. Yeah, I'm very lucky. That, that, that's, because well, of social, lucky. that's because of social media. Yeah, but that's fine. But it's not lucky. It's what you've done. It's not you can just fall into that. And it's because you're funny and people like you. And you're doing it on your own. So you're not just taking no for an answer. You're saying, okay, I'll do it my way then. Yeah. And you're doing it your way. Yeah. So that's not luck. Let's just be clear. Well, I'm, I'm lucky that people are coming to the show. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, you're, you're grateful and appreciative. Extremely, yeah. Right, and I get that. That's great that you are. But you're also, you've worked really hard for it. And you yeah. thought outside the box to get there to do it. Yeah. So why can't these other really funny people who have been killing on Kimmel or whatever, well, can they do they the have same this, thing? They can. They just, it's interesting too. Like I mentioned Bo Burnham before. His, he's able, if you see his live show, it's very much uh, who he is. He, he's able to do both perfectly. He's able to do a live performance, but he's also able to master YouTube and like digital content because that's very different. Like a lot of stand-up, all they do is they just put up their bits online. I don't really do that. Mm. My Instagram doesn't have, people don't even know that I do stand-up. Right. Which is kind of a good thing, kind of a bad thing, but it's what works for that medium. Like if, if, like I said, if you can can kill on Fallon, but more people will see you if Barstool Sports reposts you. And they don't, they don't want that. It's not only that they, they don't, they just don't want that to be true. They want it to be the 90s. They want their spot on Kimmel to mean something. They, mm-hmm. want, they want to be, uh, they want to host a sitcom. They think that this, That's the, the 1995 gold. is coming back. All right. It's like they're trying to get their VHS and Blockbuster. And I'm like, I don't know why you guys are doing, this is not, this is never going to be a thing anymore. And if you want to be the best comedian, just to have the respect of all comedians, I get that. Do you. But if you're trying to get to the next level, and you're not, and, and you're, and you're, you're like turning your head at social media. You're just a dinosaur at that point. I don't know what you're doing. It's never gonna. That, that's not going away. If yeah. anything, it's getting more powerful. And once I, I, I was one of those people who thought like, I don't want to be on YouTube. I'm an artist. I don't want to be on YouTube. And then you see these people on YouTube becoming millionaires, doing whatever they wanted anyway. They could sell scripts. They could sell out theaters. That because that's really all it is. Is people. It, you and them it's you and an audience mm. if you want to be a chef you can make recipe videos on tiktok if you want to be a makeup artist put it on tiktok and it, it, it's just the world is there for you for the taking and there's no one approving of you anymore where it used to be these gatekeepers and harvey weinstein horrific people who would literally do horrible things because he had power we've taken that away it's the most beautiful thing in the world and there are some comedians out there who are just like they just don't want that to be true, so they'd rather lie to themselves and act like, you know, oh no, but, I, but I'm a real comedian. And I, I get it, I get it, but. Yeah, it is so interesting though. It is like they, it is a totally different era and only getting more so, like it's only 100%. the beginning of that. So mm-hmm. how did you start doing the stand-up then? You wouldn't, you would, how do you go from getting into stand-up, deciding this kind of thing isn't for you, the comedy store, let's say, 
Mm. And then now you're at these other places. So did you book yourself and then like sell tickets through your social media? Like Pretty how did much. you make that? Is that how it worked? Yeah, I mean, I did, I did open mics for probably like a year, I would say. And then because I had a little bit of reputation on Staten Island, there was a comedy club there. And I did like a 15 minute spot one night. And we, I was on just the lineup of this comedy show. We sold it out because I made sure I have a giant family. They told their friends and it was, we sold it out. And I did okay. Um, I wasn't really who I, who I am yet. Like I was, it takes a while to find out who you are on stage. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the best thing for me was I was thrown to the wolves. I, I would ask in like 2018 when I started to get my, my momentum back with like a fan base because I disappeared for a while. And when Instagram started to go well again, when I moved to LA, I was calling places. A friend of mine owned a restaurant. And I was like, hey, I'm trying to do a comedy night. Like, would you be interested in that? And he was like, oh, I don't think so, man. So, uh, and then I, I, a kid at my old college I spoke about, I spoke to, we were trying to plan something and it just kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed. So I was looking for places to do something. And then um, this restaurant on Staten Island, I booked a place like 150 tickets and they sold out like in an hour. And I was like, Were you like oh my God. I, I, I wasn't happy. I was nervous. Of course. What am I going to do now? These All people right. are expecting a show. I've done 10 minutes four years ago. So it was not like looking very, very good for me. And then I just was sat in my apartment. She'd go to work and I would just think of like uh, bits that I did on Instagram and I would yeah. expand them. So like it was 60 seconds on stage. It might be like five minutes. And I just wrote a 45 minute to hour set the first couple of shows were rough i think it maybe did okay and then uh i just started doing more of those and i just kept sharpening it sharpening it sharpening it and the only, the only thing it's crazy because the only thing that got me better at stand-up was doing stand-up over and over well, they again do all say that every night but not in two minute increments oh, okay you can't yeah, get yeah, good yeah, like yeah, that I, hear what you're I was on stage for an hour by myself now make us laugh. Mm. And that's how I got good at it. Where I, whereas the other way is from the 70s and the 80s and they act like that's how, I don't know I don't know what the alternative is because if if you don't have an if you don't have an audience and people buying tickets I do understand but I don't know what it is. There's something there's there's some ways to not make it last 20 years and hand out flyers in front of the laugh factory for 10 years. And you can have we can have 1 minute at 4 in the morning. Like I don't know how the right. I don't know how people are I don't know how I don't know how they're doing it. Um I just needed a way to not. I didn't have time. I had to pay rent. I had no job. I didn't know what to do. So that was do. all a gift, actually. All that, which was like a nightmare, was a gift. The anxiety? No, not the anxiety, but maybe partially the anxiety. I think it was the but anxiety, But like the too. anxiety <laughs> and the everything not working out, the traditional route not working out. Yes. That was all a gift. Absolutely. Add the anxiety in, and then it got you to do the things that you did and got you to the place where you are now. So yeah, yeah. well, I'm going to say the anxiety was a gift, too. I, I, I think about that all the time, yeah. And that's when I started to realize, like, okay, what every time I think of, like, the traditional route of, like, what, like, even me getting in tight with these Austin comedians, like, who are huge out there, and I can tell there's some, like, not animosity. I can just tell when people don't love me, <laughs> when they're just, like, I'm not one of the guys, and I can tell, like, if people aren't, don't like me. And I'm thinking, like, this is me trying to be traditional again. Uh, you no. Know. And I'm like, yeah. I gotta stop doing this. This is not my strength. Every time I try to do the traditional route, it goes horribly wrong. You gotta do what you're good at, Eric. Do what you're good at. Stick to, um, double down on the uh, internet stuff. Double down on whatever you were doing. Don't try to be like these people because you're not like them. They did it a different way. They've been doing stand-up for 15 years and that's not you. So yeah, it, it was definitely... A gift and I, I also believe that like uh, notoriety and whatever you want to call it it's better to have that late, later on in life and I think that people don't really I feel I feel bad for Justin Bieber I think he's uh, permanently changed from what happened to him just being that famous that rich it's so young there's just like a look in his eyes that's just like he's gone. I, I, I you could put Britney Spears in that. Britney, too. Oh, one thousand. Yeah, I get, and a million I, other people. One, a million percent. Yeah. And they're they're really not spiritually there anymore, and it's devastating. It's sad. It's really sad. Yeah. And I think if that would have happened, I think that was a blessing. If that would have happened with my first manager, I would. I don't know where I'd be right now. 
I might be a mess. Yeah, maybe, but I think also depends on who you are, your personality. It, it, and all it, that's we too. don't know anything. Yeah, right, I could have exactly, died in a plane exactly. crash. Who the hell knows? But well, that too. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it, the butterfly effect, right? But yeah, so I think uh, everything happens for a reason. I'm happy to be where I am now. Just just being able to make money from stand up is the coolest thing. Yeah. I have such a fun time with my that's shows. So cool. I have the greatest fans in the world, and uh, yeah, just so. I'm so lucky to be able to do this just doing what so I'm doing. you're basically running your own tours then yeah or do you well, have with like the help a- of my amazing uh, yeah my amazing team as you would say oh, okay okay <laughs> with the help of your amazing team you're running your own so you're deciding all that stuff too so you're totally in the driver's seat oh yeah completely all right so let me just ask you about I need to know a little bit about your creative process sure because your clips are so funny. Oh, I thank love you. turning on Instagram and seeing you showing up. And I always have to put the volume on because I usually have it all muted. <laughs> for you, I click uh, the bo- I've, I've button. I've been told that too. You got to put uh, captions, but I'm like, no, all my delivery. And no, like, no, 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 no captions. Can't read the same stuff. Although people can kind of start to hear your voice, I think, when they see you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like yeah, kind yeah. of. Talk, I, if I put like a tweet up or something on my face, yeah. people are like I read this in your voice, exactly. which is kind of cool. So that's a good sign, yeah, and I feel good. like that you have that voice that so people would know how you would be saying it. So, all right, so you, let's take a, a little clip like, um, for example, that the clip about pronouncing your name okay. was hilarious. Okay. Oh, thank you. So what was your process? So you write it all out first, you decide what you're gonna say, you decide who the characters are gonna be, you film a million times, who's filming you, give me all the deets. Oh man, uh, that one, I, for, I don't even remember how that happened, but I have, a, I have clips of people from Austin announcing me and every time it gets wor- it gets worse and worse and worse. If you have if you see if people if people see an apostrophe, their heads explode. It's happened my whole life. The airlines is Eric Dahl, and they don't they just don't know what they don't know what's going on. My name is the Italian language is incredibly phonetic. It is exactly what it looks like. It's exactly how it's said. Mm-hmm. And um, the only thing it's not is Sandro. But everybody Eric Dallacentrioli, and I'm like what? So I think that just I think I was probably looking at film from somebody who introduced me and I was I, I don't know what the, I don't know where I got the idea from but I would just sit there and she has to listen to me as she's having coffee and I'm just like laughing to myself saying like all the different names that people say and then I write down which ones I like I film a million of I'll just be like sit, standing there with me just saying a bunch of them and then depending on how long it should be like if, a, if it's a minute I gotta make it perfect but like that one's that one's very specific the other ones are it's writing stand up. That's exact. That's so you sit there and you write it. That's how I got good at stand up, was get, becoming a stand up comedian on Instagram. I found I'm like I'm giving my secrets away a little bit too much, but like, I found this hole that no one was doing. No one was doing this. I was like, it was it, my open mic was my stand up. I mean, was my Instagram, where I would try a bit, and if it gets 300 likes, you that's know like kind of chuckles. 3,000 uh, likes. Okay, okay. Right. There, that's so you're a, testing all your material there. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. But I noticed there's a lot of jump cuts because you must have a million takes in it. And it's funny because I know you're trying to get it into one minute. Yeah, you're like, you talk so fast. I'm, like, I'm no, trying no, to fit it so in there. No, no, it's so great because I, at first I was like, how does he do all this in perfectly like that? And then yeah. I realized, because well, I think I heard you say something about it, like that you edit it. Of course, you yeah. have to absolutely. To get I write that. every single one. So you of them. write everything. I think, people, I think people think I'm just randomly of, of rambling off the top of my right. head. But you're not. No. So you're absolutely. writing each one, and then you're performing it on film, and then you're doing it. Like how many takes are you doing that you're going to end up editing? Usually only once or twice. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. And then who edits it? Me. All right. Yeah. I love. I was. I was an editor for years. I love editing. I used to do weddings and proms. That I hated. But my. But my. My own stuff. I've always loved. Cause like I said, I had a video camera when I was really, really little, and I always thought like, how do you add music? How do you put something in slow motion? Mm. And I never knew how to do it. So when I finally learned how to do it, I was just like. So what are you using? Premiere Pro. Hand. No, I use Final Cut. Mm. Ooh, I'm, an a- Pro. I'm an Apple boy. I, I'm, you, you know, I'm funny? an Apple girl too. But Premier you know, when, you know when people fall like pe- Apple used to have this, uh, this, this. I'm sure they still do. But like people who love Apple are kind of like CrossFit people. Like they, it's like the same sort of like. Oh, I'm a vegan. Like they love to tell you how much they love something. Because when I had Windows computers, I would have Windows Movie Maker or something, and it just never worked. It would just be error 404. I have the I have the plug I'm supposed to have. I have the 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 microphone I'm supposed to have. I have the camera, and it just doesn't work. No one knows how to help me. There's no one to call. Annoying, There's nothing. Yeah. So I finally got an Apple computer. I never forget. The guy told me use this cord. I'm like, you sure this is gonna work? 
He's like, yeah. I'm like, I've done this before since I was 14. Never worked. Perfectly worked seamlessly. You can call Apple directly. Yeah. This is their software. And I will die for Apple. I'll never not. And that's another thing why people are like, oh, why? I think people think Apple is overrated. They Now they are because Steve Jobs died. But they they saved my life. And I loved editing. So I'll never leave Final Cut only because mm -hmm. I just fell in love with it. Well, I way. love Apple too, just for the record. I still love Apple. Um, Randy Rainbow, do you know him? No. You don't know Randy Rainbow. You should. Huh? You should know Randy Rainbow because he's okay. a comedian, internet comedian, basically. Mm -hmm. And now he does his anyone. own tours. Okay. He's a lot older than you, but he does these like, um, I'll have to just send you a link. I yeah, send me a link. But he uses, send I thought me a Randy he, Rainbows. Uses, he uses Final Cut Pro as well. Um, so does Bo And Burnham. his videos are excellent. <laughs> but, okay, so that's the video thing. Um, so how about the girl clothes and stuff? Do you get annoyed having to be like a woman because people laugh so much at it? Do you like it? Like what? Um, a part of it, Dave Chappelle once had this great thing about uh, on Oprah when he was like, he, he, I mean, obviously, I shouldn't even. I don't know if I should say this, but like he, he know he looked back in 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 time. He's like, how many black comedians have been dressed up as women? He thought it was like this sort of disrespectful. He's like, everybody you could think of Martin Lawrence, all these people. Yeah, I think I heard this. Yes. Yeah, and he and he he said when he did Blue Streak, they're like, "Why you wear a dress?" And he was like, "What? I'm not doing that." So a little part of me is always thinks of Dave. Like, man, Dave would be so disappointed in me, <laughs> but. Um, no, I don't, it's, it's, I, I, it's, it is a little cheap. Like, oh, the joke is that guys wearing girls' clothes. Like, that I get. That's it, not the joke. It's not. But I see I see people who are haters of mine and be like, he really likes to dress up like in women's clothing. But it's just like, I have my analytics. I'm 75% women oh, following me. Oh, are you? Okay. So okay. it's like, I'm making content for them. And this is the stuff that they're going to relate to. So I want them to like it. And if it's funnier, if I'm wearing a crop top, then there you go. You know, I'm It is be... very funny, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. You're both, both are funny. When you're, you know, a man and when you're in women's clothes, both are hilarious. Of course, obviously, that um, Walmart video was oh, really. Oh, the Karen one. The Karen. Yeah, that was. Oh, my God. I showed it to him with my son. Oh, my nice. Husband, I was like, you got it. <laughs> Everybody was dying. That one, obviously. Yeah, that was my biggest thing I've ever works. had. But even the one you just did the other day about, uh, uh, what was it? Just driving, you're being your girlfriend driving in the car. In Florida. Funny. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, it works. Both work. So you just you just have a, uh, a bigger repertoire. Oh, I would like, uh, you, you know what I mean? By done, yeah. But you're not limiting yourself to only wearing the women's oh, clothes. Oh, of course. Or yeah, only yeah, being I, a man. Yeah. Yeah, but I've I've noticed that there's a complete discrepancy sometimes. There there's some people who who tune in for the same exact thing, mm -hmm. which I, I do. That was always like my biggest fear, and I will see comments like this kid does the same thing over, and I get it. But it's like you no, know but what? That, that's what everybody. I don't care. So, it's if, funny. If, that's, if that's what people want, they want it. I'm there to make you laugh, and that's what you want. I'm gonna do. I'm I don't have an ego about it anymore. I used to, I used to think that like that was bad, and I'm like, who, who do you think you are? Just 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 put on the freaking clown makeup and make these people laugh, clown. So do your job and yeah, shut up. It's all good. It's <laughs> yeah. all good. All right. So um, let me ask you like two closing questions and we'll wrap up. So I feel like you answered this already. That one of my the big questions is what's the image that people have of you? So like who do people assume that you are? People don't really know you. I don't. I I, I don't know. I, I don't. I. How could I? Okay. I think. Um, they think that I'm gay. That's a big one. I don't know if that's like a, a, a jealousy thing of guys who are like, who are insecure and don't know how to say, I'm, I'm intimidated by and They're like, what is he, gay? I think I get that a lot. Okay. Maybe more Italian than I am. Uh -huh. I have a whole bit in my act about how like, yes, I'm, I'm very much an Italian American. Especially when I lived in LA, I felt like Joe Pesci in, in um, my cousin Vinny. Yeah, yeah, I just watched that a couple months but, ago. Uh, you stick out like a sore thumb? Yeah. I think I have, especially because I don't know if people realize I put on like a voice yeah. a lot of the times. So I think I get that. Maybe that I'm way sillier than I, I, I come off. I'm actually very serious. I, I'm, I seldom, I seldom goof, goof. Or, I mean, like around the house I am and stuff. But like if I'm like at a restaurant or if I'm hanging, I mean, I, I don't like to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. It's hard for people to understand that. Like, oh yeah, sure you don't. But I don't. Uh, it's because like when I'm performing, yeah, of course I'm doing something that's specific, but like I don't want you to look at me if I'm not supposed to. I just, I'm not trying to be the guy who needs attention on him because I'm always aware of people thinking, oh, well, he needs to look, wait, you don't get enough attention, Eric? Like I like to just be left alone or to be doing something weird on my own, so. Um, yeah, yeah, so who you really are, you just answered my second question. Who are you really? Yeah, I'm just, a, I, I, uh, 
I think I'm more of an artist than 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 I I express because it's tough. You know, I I do some stuff that I really believe in, and then it's funny. I, I whenever I'm I'm live on Instagram, I'll have like 350 people tuning in. I'll take out the guitar before I can even play a string. A hundred people sign off. <laughs> So like, I love music, I love writing, I love doing things that is not like this clown, but people are not interested in that. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Well, you do it for you. That's cool, exactly. Yeah, you it's, do it but for it, you. But it makes it a little more special too when it's like just yours, you know? But I love music, I'm a huge, uh, I love to create music. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm a little bit of a weirdo. I'm way deeper of a thinker than I, I, I put out there because I'm afraid everybody's gonna be offended by something, but we, we, we're starting a podcast and I've already made her record three other, like a bunch of them over and then because I'm like, this is too, this is too deep. People are going to hate me because I'm, I'm analyzing things too much and I don't want people to, I like people to, to escape with my stuff. That's why I don't talk about politics because like I don't care what you yeah. are. I just want you to laugh. This is not, these are not statements from some, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I just want people to be kind to one another and not judge and have this stupid idea of the world and the way that you want it to be and just be nice and down the middle. Um, so yeah, I guess, I don't know, can you think of anything else? I'm allergic to fruit. <laughs> Is that good? That's perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. So interesting, right? The whole comedy, old guard, new guard situation? Fascinating. Don't forget to check out behind the scenes photos, YouTube videos, and my new experimental clips on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And join me in my new really famous friends and fans fan group on Facebook. Links to everything are in the show notes. I'm Kara. This is Really Famous. Talk to you very soon. Hi, I'm Eric D'Alessandro. I just talked to Kara on the Really Famous podcast, which I don't know if that is appropriate for me, but we talked about love, life, my anxiety problems, and my allergy to fruit. That's right, all fruit. And then someone's gonna say, what about apples? Yes, I just said all fruit. So please tune in.